Oh, I don't even want to get into the politics of that shit. So the ref would basically allow DKU to break every rule in boxing. The art of fighting without fighting? Show me some of it. Hi there, everybody. Michael Valenti here with the School of Self-Defense in Indianapolis. And in today's video, I'm just going to be talking about that crazy fight between DKU and Brad Scott. Before we get into the actual fight, of course, I have to do the obligatory reminder that if you're new to the channel, be sure to hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, and click the bell so you get notified whenever I release a new video. So for those of you who don't know, DKU is a self-proclaimed martial arts guru, and he has a very strong following because he has a lot of very similar aesthetics and even demoing skills as Bruce Lee, and he talks a very big game and can put on some very impressive demos, which is all good. I mean, there's nothing really all that wrong with somebody who just loves martial arts and people like them for loving martial arts. The problem with the guy is that he has a huge ego, and he claimed that he'd be able to beat any UFC fighter. Now, whereas I am very confident in my ability to defend myself, and I'm even more confident in my ability to teach the art of self-defense, I am not convinced that I am some sort of UFC fighter. And I think most people in the self-defense world are not that delusional. Whereas there are a lot of similarities between self-defense and the sport of MMA, ultimately they are two very different disciplines that require two very different sets of skills. I want to make it clear, I'm not saying that someone who does MMA is incapable of defending themselves. What I'm saying is that these are different things. And it's important to understand that because if you don't, what happened to DKU may very well happen to you. So DKU claimed that he could beat any UFC fighter, and the UFC fighter, Bradley Scott, stepped up to the challenge. Now, unfortunately, this wasn't an MMA match. I think that would have been far more entertaining to see. Instead, it was a boxing match. I'm not really sure of the details behind it, because it's not like DKU doesn't throw kicks and doesn't teach takedowns. So I would have liked to see how that guy was able to use his martial art in a more wide spectrum than boxing, but ultimately we got a boxing match, which made me kind of regret wanting to see any of his martial arts because if he's that bad at boxing, I, I almost assure you he's worse at the other aspects of martial arts. So the basic way that the fight ended up playing out was with Bradley Scott kind of charging forward, looking for a really heavy hit in the first few rounds, and then the last few rounds focusing more on using a tight strategy of doing a lot of heavy blows to the body and then catching uppercuts and shots to the head whenever he would get a chance. And it seems that DKU's general strategy was to run out the clock. Whereas he did throw some punches, none of them were the quick, explosive Bruce Lee-esque punches that we see him do in his demos. Instead, they were kind of wild, amateurish punches that I'd expect to see from anybody who's never actually sparred or fought before. It shows you how easy it is for someone to throw a strike in the air or on a bag and look good and actually have no idea of how to actually fight in real life. Whereas in order to teach, we generally need our partner to be relatively still so we can kind of show finer details of a technique. If you've only ever thrown punches at a bag or broke boards or done demos, then you have missed the fact that the real art of boxing is footwork, not punches. So the second the fight starts, DKU is already making serious beginner mistakes when it comes to boxing. So DKU is standing in a southpaw stance, which is my preferred boxing stance. So I'm very familiar with that strategy. However, he's moving like completely incorrectly for that stance. So when someone is in like a boxing stance, you have a lead hand and a rear hand. And generally speaking, you wanna be moving to the outside of their lead hand because generally the knockout punch is coming from the rear and you don't wanna align yourself with that punch. 
Furthermore, when you align yourself with this punch, you're also aligned with this punch. So now you have to deal with two hands as opposed to when you move to the outside line in boxing because back fists are not allowed, you make it harder for them to hit you with their cross and effectively nullify their ability to throw a jab because they're gonna have to shift their body. So we call this moving to the outside line. He's also taking kind of a shitty version of a Philly shell where his lead hand is down. Now, the lead hand down is a valid boxing structure, but I highly recommend you waiting until you know you're faster than your opponent to do a Philly shell. That when you first start a boxing match, you should be keeping your hands up, keeping yourself sh safe, and then adjust the lead hand uh, to the preferences of your opponent. So like I tend to hold my hands very high when I box, and I'll only drop that lead hand if my opponent just starts working my body and I'm getting sick of being hit in the stomach. Um, Generally speaking, I'm not the fastest puncher on earth, so I tend to avoid the Philly shell because, in my opinion, that's a much more for like a speed-based fighter, which I'm sure DKU thinks he is. So he's standing in southpaw, and he's moving in the wrong direction and keeping his lead hand down. So one of the most common mistakes I see with people who are switch hitters, who want to, you know, fight from southpaw and from orthodox, so that's right side forward versus left side forward, is that they think you can just take the same exact strategy and mirror it, and when you switch your stance and that's not how it works and there is a principle in boxing we call the southpaw advantage and to fully take advantage of that advantage you have to understand the strategy and how it differs from the orthodox stance so not only was his footwork you know not really moving in the right direction he also was missing a critical aspect of boxing which is ring control so whenever you're fighting inside of an enclosed space, so whether it's a boxing ring or a UFC cage or even like a hallway or something, um, you know, that's confining, you're basically not in a parking lot. The idea of ring control is to have as much territory behind you as possible. So the ideal space for me is you in the corner of the ring and me you know, in front of you, so I have the whole ring behind me. Another way to think about it is always keeping the center of the ring pointed towards your back. Ring control is very important because it allows you more maneuverability defensively and it limits the defensive maneuverability of your opponent because they can't move back. And if you get them in the corner, it's they can't move side to side either. And absolutely, there are times in which you must give ground in a fight in order to stay in a range that is preferable to your particular fighting style. Ultimately, the person with their back to the center of the ring tends to be winning the fight. And if you go back and you watch the fight, almost the entire time, DKU is getting pushed around by his opponent. And even when they aren't actually physically touching each other, he is constantly having to move backwards. And there's several times in which Bradley Scott gets him close to the ropes and you see DKU trying to like juke him and Bradley Scott just takes a sidestep, take a sidestep and maintains that ring control, which of course shows a high level of skill from Bradley Scott, but it also was very clear that DKU had no real strategy for how to maneuver out of that bad situation. Now what DKU did was he primarily was trying to bridge the gap and get into a clinch and kind of let the referee separate them. For those of you who are not familiar with the sport of boxing, generally speaking, when two people clinch, they aren't really allowed to throw punches at each other anymore and the referee splits them up which that referee was suspect as hell, and I'll talk about that more here in a second. So DKU wasn't really fighting, he was mostly just trying to get into the clinch and run out the clock. His punches were absolutely awful. The two things that really showed me that this guy had no clue how to fight was what happened to him when he would get hit and what happened to him when he would get clinched. Almost every single time Bradley Scott landed a decent blow on the dude's face, he would straight up turn around, like turning his back to his opponent. And this guy claims to teach self-defense, and self-defense 101 is that you always keep your center line on your opponent even when getting hit. If I recall correctly, the first time he really got punched in the face, he even did that thing where they like check to see if there's blood. I I've only ever seen someone do that when they are like really, really new to striking. What's even more troubling than that, which really show that this guy had no business picking fights with professional fighters, is what happened whenever Bradley Scott would put him in a clinch. 
what would happen is Bradley Scott would do just like a basic Muay Thai clinch. And I don't, I don't completely understand how this was happening, but he'd go to snap him down, which is a pretty standard procedure in any kind of wrestling or jujitsu or judo. And DKU would fall to the ground like a brand new baby horse. From what I understand, DKU is constantly talking about structure and body weight distribution and, and, and things like that. And then this guy just grabs him by the head and snaps him down like a basic high school wrestling sort of maneuver. And he goes flying to the ground as though he's never had someone do that to him before. Which means he's never had someone do that to him before. The dude could really use some wrestling or some judo. Like, or any martial arts training at all. The only thing that I can really give DKU credit for is the fact that he made it to the final bell. I think most of us assumed that he would have been knocked out in the first round. Of course, I think that's exactly what his strategy was because as I mentioned earlier, he mostly kind of would like go in for the clinch and then just wait for the ref to separate them, which I can't hold off talking about this ref any longer. This is some of the most propaganda-esque shit I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh, I don't even want to get into the policy of that shit. So the ref would basically allow DKU to break every rule in boxing. DKU would hold for too long, he would do back fist, and believe it or not, you're not actually allowed to turn your back to your opponent in boxing. That's actually breaking the rules. And I don't know if he actually got called on any of that. But when the constant clinching first started, Bradley Scott did what any trained fighter would do, which was that he threw some strikes. Now, granted, oftentimes he was kind of holding while he was striking, which generally is also against the rules of boxing. And the ref was very quick to reprimand him for that. At one point near the end of the fight, the referee deducted a point from Bradley Scott for I don't know what. Whereas once again, I can't stress enough that DKU was kind of doing all this same shit, plus hitting with the back of the glove and turning. And continuing with my suspect that DKU is trying to get to that final bell and that the ref in particular was helping him is that the ref would take an eternity to separate them. Generally, whenever two boxers end up clinching with each other, the referee is basically instantly there to say, all right, break it up. Maybe he might give it like one or two seconds to see if space is created. But at one point, Bradley Scott even checked an imaginary watch waiting for the referee to separate them. Every bit as much as I question whether or not DKU has ever actually fought someone, I also question whether or not this ref has ever refereed a boxing match. Because that was just remarkably bad refing, just unreasonably bad. So the fight ends up going to the final bell. Good for you, DKU. Oddly enough, of the three judges, one of the judges actually declared it a tie, which, which once again just goes more into that psychotic propaganda of this entire event. And of course, the other two judges had some sort of sanity and declared Bradley Scott as the victor. And then just to put the propaganda icing on top of the propaganda cupcake, the interview at the end. To be honest, I don't really remember what they interviewed Bradley Scott for. I can't remember what he said. I, I recall him saying that he thought the point deduction was bullshit, which it was. But man, when they, when they interviewed DKU, Oh my gosh. Instantaneously, you could see the picture that was trying to be painted. Not going through them point for point, the interviewer themselves pointed out the fact that DKU was older than Bradley Scott, was smaller than Bradley Scott, and DKU had some neck and shoulder problems that made it so he really couldn't use one of his arms. And as I was listening to the interview, I realized what was happening, that it was the plan the whole time. What he could do was make himself into a Rocky story where the underdog, the guy who wasn't supposed to win, managed to go the distance with the champ. Of course, the real martial arts community can see right through all that bullshit, but ultimately that's not what he cares about. He cares about maintaining his cult of personality and adding another story to his legend. So ultimately, it was a pretty stupid and boring boxing match to watch. It just blows my mind when I see these supposed martial arts masters become so delusional that they actually allow themselves to believe their own bullshit. But I suppose that's the only way that they can sleep at night and keep on selling it. 
A self-defense instructor isn't really all that special. We're just kind of like a sign in the road that points people in the right direction. Someone comes up to me and they say, I want to get to this particular place. I want this particular body. I want this particular level of expertise. I want this particular level of fighting ability. And then my job is to point them in the right direction and then they have to go and do the road work. They have to do the work themselves. That's all a self-defense teacher is. They are just a sign that points you in the right direction. I think Yoda said something to the extent of we are what they move beyond. And that's effectively what a teacher is. That we are nothing special at all. And any teacher who thinks more of themselves than just a general guide to the world of martial arts, they're delusional. And the reason why I bring this up is because that's how you end up with this cult of personality is that you have people who view their martial arts instructors as something like to be revered, something to be almost worshipped. And even worse then, a lot of times those instructors will lean into it. Because I'll be real, I've had students kind of idolize me and put me on a pedestal and that feels really, really good. But it's your job as an instructor when people do that to knock yourself down several pins. Tell them not to think of you that way. Remind them of the fact that as a martial arts instructor, as a self-defense instructor, all you are is a guide. All you are is pointing them in the right direction. It is not me that you are in love with. It is martial arts that you are in love with. I think the lesson to be learned from this fight is just the general dangers of ego in the world of martial arts. In almost any other activity, having an ego ultimately doesn't result in that much harm. If I think I'm a really good painter and I'm not, eh, it's not really that big of a deal. It's good that I think I'm a good painter. It's, it's nice. But if I think I'm a really good fighter and I'm not, I might accept a fight with a UFC fighter and get my ass kicked for six rounds. If you made it to the end of this video, you clearly are enjoying this content. So be sure to click the thumbs up, click the subscribe and the bell button so you know whenever I make new videos. Now, of course, a lot of people like to comment on my videos, having not watched the entire thing. So incorporate the phrase body blow into your comment so that you and I know you made it to the end. And of course, if you live in the Indianapolis area and you'd like to come train self-defense with me, all the information you need to get started is on our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. And if you live too far away to train with me in person, I do offer Zoom classes. Once again, the information you need for that is on our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. So until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Check your egos and fight on.